As we wait a couple of minutes uh, for more people to join, um, I just want to start off uh, by introducing myself. I'm Nina Sadowski. I will be leading the discussion with Kyle today. Um, I just wanted to start off uh, with a land acknowledgement, um, which as you can see is posted on your screens. Um, this is a, a new initiative that we've created this to acknowledge um, the land on which our academic center sits. Um, we just wanna take a moment to do that um, and make that part of our uh, ongoing practice um, here at um, NYU Los Angeles. Um, so I am very, very pleased today and I'm gonna bring my video on. Um, hi everyone. I am very, very pleased today um, to introduce Kyle Cord. And I forget exactly how I met Kyle, but I was immediately impressed by him because Kyle is a disruptor. And I like someone who wants to make a little good trouble. Um, and I liked a lot of his ideas about um, what he had to say about where he thought the industry was and where he thought it could go. And um, so I'm really pleased today to welcome Kyle Quartz. Hello, did I do that right? <laughs> was that prompted well? Yeah, that was perfect. So cool. Kyle, why don't we begin, um, just tell me a little bit about your background and how you came to launch the Orphanage Collective. Yeah, um, well, I grew up in Southern California, like to a single mother, and then I was just watching TV and movies and creating as I was growing up. And then I uh, went to NYU for film school and uh, really like focus on writing and what I wanted to do there. And as I was in New York, everybody was kind of saying that, you know, if you want to write for television, which I did at the time, and uh, they were like, you should go to LA. And then so I was like, okay. And so I just packed up all my stuff, moved. And then I started doing kind of the traditional quote unquote ladder of Hollywood, um, where I just took like hundreds of generals and just kind of uh, slept in my car for a bit of time. And I was really trying to figure out something because a lot of the world was like you should apply to fellowships and just meet people that was what everybody uh kept on kind of saying and so i was like okay i'll just go to the end of the rainbow with that and then i had about you know i i, I was an assistant for about eight eight years seven years um and i just kind of got to see how much like the industry sort of perpetuates a lot of really uh uh problematic things to young people that puts them in a scenario that they're not going to really benefit. And I think that they kind of convince you in a way uh, to buy lottery tickets and not genuinely build a career. And so I have found that like from observing people for the past decade, the people that have been most successful are the people that just like get their things made and not somebody that's just like in a calendar uh, or rolling calls. And so I was trying to think about why is the system tell people that they can like make it doing these things when in reality, that's not really what happens. And it's such a small percentage actually make it doing that, that it's like, it's almost a, an error uh, and, or just enough to keep the, the sort of like, I don't know, the, the, uh, that story alive so that a bunch of Harvard, going, right? Yeah, it's like, it's, you know, they kind of tell that story because they want people to work for minimum wage thinking that their dreams are gonna come true in a year. Um, and Can you clarify, were you a writer's assistant during that time or like an agent's yeah. assistant? Can you clarify? Yeah, my, my, my sort of path up is I started out on set as a set PA and I went to be an NBC page and I was an NBC page for a year and I worked for Jen Salky who now runs Amazon and I worked in Donna Langley's department for Universal Pictures and got to see them and how all that operated and then I was at Universal Cable Productions uh, when they were doing Mr. Robot and then after that I went to go work for Damon Lindelof on The Leftovers in Tomorrowland. And then I was the writer's assistant on that for its final season. Then I went to go work for Sam Esmail as his writer's assistant on a lot of his projects. And then I, uh, after that, um, uh, you know, did the writer's assistant a couple more times and worked, some, worked for some notable people until I realized that I needed to kind of shift and figure out something else to empower not only me, but my environment and try to create something that felt more holistic and sustainable and, uh, 
So yeah, so I was, uh, I very much kind of after that. Myth. I mean, in some ways you were working like the myth of the Hollywood career, right? You get yeah. in there, you work as an assistant, you get to know people, that lands you finally in the, as a writer's assistant, and then you work your way up and finally, you know, you get that shot at writing an episode. And you said, so you were like kind of successfully on that proscribed path and you just said the hell with this, I got to blow this up. Right, that's sort of what happened. Yeah, because I was looking kind of down the road, it seemed like what is, even if I had a success in that environment, it would have been literally like winning a lottery ticket, a lottery ticket. It wouldn't have really begetted more success. It would have just been getting to the top of the mountain and then having to go to the bottom of the mountain again. And I wanted to kind of figure out what were the things that I saw that were making people the most successful in this industry. And that was often through, um, creating like a sustainable financial system for them while they're still practicing their craft and then having enough uh, income and, and resources and, and uh, communal sort of support to create their own content, whether that was podcasts or shorts or web series or comic books. And I just like thought that that was so much better. And, you know, the, the I, what I've been saying in Hollywood is that the tastemakers have died. And what they do is that they're now like sourcing out being like the Atlantic's gonna have an article, like the New Yorker's gonna have some story that we're gonna co-opt. Like there's a novelist, like we were, we have like basically all of the manuscripts come to us first from Penguin Ran Random House. And so they basically are relying on these outside sources, image comics, like they're sort of like these people are curating and they're able to prove test of audience. And then we will just basically take that and then develop it. They're not like, you know, screenplays aren't really the things that are getting- Do you think part of the problem is increased reliance on IP just because- Yeah, and so I, I wanted to kind of create a system in which we were naturally generating our own IP and getting our stories out there because a lot of me and my, uh, my friends and my collaborators are all storytellers that want to tell stories and a lot, in a lot of ways, stories that haven't really been told before. And so I wanted to create an environment where those could happen with hard work, not just be uh, uh, a maybe. And so that's where that was. Just, I think even now increasingly, I mean, the, in an industry that used to be very uh, rigidly controlled by demographics, right? I mm -hmm. think even now it's being controlled even more so by algorithms, right? Like, yeah. you know, not even like, you know, a little demographic research and a gut instinct, right? Which is sort of what, you know, as you say, the tastemakers, that sort of, come out of the equation in Hollywood. Yeah. It's algorithm, IP, what's the safe bet generated kind of decisions. And I, you know, I know I personally have been feeling that the system is an impediment to my own creation, right? I, mm -hmm. you know, I'm in development and I don't get to make anything, right? Which is partly why yeah. I started writing books, because then you get to actually make something. So, you know, I know for I for one decided I'm just going to go short, shoot a short this summer because I'm going to make something and I want the system to stop being a barrier. So is That's that- That's amazing. Well, thank you. But I'm, I'm wondering, is that, so is that sort of what you guys are doing? You're not, well, maybe we should back up a second. Can you talk mm -hmm. about like how the collective works to create this more sustainable environment yeah. for writers, what the structure is, how it works. Um, and just let's start there, unpack that a little bit for us. Yeah. So, you know, uh, the major thing that like was, you know, we've talked about is orphanage, which is the management uh, kind of reimagined, which is what I was finding was, uh, you know, I was, re I was represented by some fairly notable people that should have like made all of my dreams come true. And when I realized it was kind of, it didn't work that way. Most of the things that I felt like were adding value were things that I was creating for value for myself. And in, in a way, it was also kind of doing the work for the manager because it was like, they were leveraging my network system to like ingratiate themselves more with HBO. They were doing a lot of these things that were kind of feeding off of me. And they weren't actually adding tremendous value. And I remember talking to one of them and I'm like, I don't feel like you're doing much. I've gotten more meetings and, I, and you've even gotten meetings from me. Like what's happening? Why, why is this worth this? And I don't understand. And he was just like, my name on your script is what the value is. And I was like, okay. And then I had a lot of friends who would just basically stay with managers that they would just be ghosted from like, for six months, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, you haven't talked to your manager in six months. Like, why, why is it happening? It's like, I don't know. It's better to have somebody's name on my thing than not. And I just want to like do all these things. And so people are kind of like accepting like scraps that are being thrown at them. And they're not even scraps. Like they're, it's like, it's, it's imaginary. It's, it's like, uh, it's like that scene in hook if the food never showed up, you know? Um, and I just think with my perception on that, most of the value that was actually being created was having to be created by the creatives. 
And what they were having to do is they've created networking groups, they've created writers groups, they've created all these things that used to be uh, the typical sort of responsibility of representation. And, and then when the agents were like, oh, you know, there's more supply than, or there's more supply than there is demand. What we can do is basically create ourselves in a position where we're going to kind of uh, basically get whatever we want because they, people have to have agents to be successful. That's what Hollywood says. And we're at a point where people will literally give their left pinky toe to be with us. And we know that. And so they exploit that. And, and basically all of the energy and all of the work goes into basically their top 1% of clients and everybody else in the bottom, it's incredibly difficult to break. Even if they do care about somebody, the system's just not built to favor those people. And so, I don't know, I just had gone through kind of enough cycles and seeing what the value that creatives created. And I was getting really frustrated and it got to the point where I was like, I, and it was kind of, it was right before all of the WGA stuff happened. And, uh, and so I was like, I think we should just, I think we should just create a representation company that is ran by creatives because we know what we want, we know what we need. And why are we accepting what all these other people are saying to us when in reality, they're kind of taking a bunch of things, hiding things from us. They're not working in our best interest, they're working in their interests. And, and I thought that we had already done so much for ourselves anyways, why not just like, why not just like take the hard step just to say, let's just create something that is represented, a representation company that is representative of quality. And that uh, the way that we distribute money is that's the 10% that comes back in to us uh, and we kind of work as like a cooperative model and so explain uh, that a little bit more explain the cooperative model and how how things are monetized because I think that's yeah um you know I developed this idea of like mutual aid because I was doing a lot of like reading into like various socialist you know sort of programs and other things that other countries have done when they were kind of like under like a huge collapsing capitalist structure and it felt like it was like an easy or like a very useful conduit to understand what I was going to do. And so there was this, there's this concept of mutual aid where people put money into a fund and it's distributed to a certain amount of people. And so I was like, oh, that's a, that's a really clean, efficient way to do this is that after all the costs of the company are, are uh, paid for and the various programs that we want to have, um, what essentially the excess funds do is they, they get divided up among the members of the group. So for instance, if there's, if there's 10 people in orphanage and we have hundred dollars, each person gets $10. And so, uh, so that also what that does is it, in another way is sort of psychologically unravels the sort of like the, the rugged individualism that is present in Hollywood, where they make you feel like that you need to be in competition with everyone and that you are, you know, you need to just, you're alone, nobody's going to help you. And if you try to help anybody, it's just going to hurt you. And so I wanted to kind of disassemble it a little bit more where if people heard of a job opportunity or they had something, they would immediately be like, oh, like I want to support this person because uh, that actually financially incentivizes me because in some way that is fed back into the collective and fed back into me. And so it's sort of creating a, a, uh, like an economic structure in which it cultivates community and support um, while also still existing within the constructs that we Very are existing in. Because I think that you're right that there is this sort of mentality in Hollywood. Well, two, two things. One, that there's never enough. So you have a two picture deal. Why isn't it three? You know, if you're dying, yeah. driving a Mercedes, why isn't it a Lamborghini? So like there's that mythology of what, yeah. of never enough, right? And I think there's also this sense that there, you know, that this mythology that is perpetuated and you addressed it well, there are not enough jobs. There are too many people who want these jobs. Therefore, another writer is your enemy, is your competition. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's interesting because when I moved over into book publishing, what I discovered was that there was a lot of author to author generosity. Mm -hmm. And I realized because the, the, that whole idea of scarcity doesn't supply. Not everyone reads books, but people who read books read all the books. They don't wanna, yeah. if they read my book, they're not gonna not read your book, right? So authors yeah. are incredibly generous in terms of promoting each other, in terms of, you know, doing uh, blurbs for one another, really supporting the community in a yeah. way that I haven't really seen in Hollywood until, you know, I heard about what you were doing. Uh, but it makes so much sense. Yeah, it kind of like when I started thinking about it, it made me incredibly terrified. And it also just felt like it was incredibly important. And often when I feel afraid of something, it often means that it's probably important to do. And so I kind of like used that as fuel to, I don't know, create the momentum to actually do it. So um, how, I mean, I know you work differently. Um, do you charge a 
a 10% that then goes into the communal pot? How do, how do the economics work? So yes. any, any writer within the collective, and, and it would be great if you could give us specifics, how many people are in it, how they're selected, all of that. Yeah, so currently we are, um, we are at our uh, pilot crew of five people. And so for the past year we had, we expanded and then we realized that we should shrink down a bit because, um, you know, various reasons that I will not get into, but you know, just essentially like uh, there was creative differences over what uh, certain people in the collective wanted it to be, how they wanted to operate and like, you know, lack of accountability. And so there were some people that were sort of like exploiting it and not really helping. And so when we saw that, we kind of were like, how do we construct like the, the DNA of the seed of this? And the way it kind of operates is that we have an, we have an, an assistant that essentially divided up among us, like everybody's able to use. And also um, we have, uh, we've constructed, we kind of took Pixar DNA uh, of their brain trust and we made that into our like kind of writer's group plus. And so there's a lot of kind of like, uh, I don't know, sort of like ideology that we've sort of created in steps and ways that we can manufacture a development process uh, within the group so that there is a collective sort of uh, con contribution and help uh, to overcome creative problems. And um, like, for instance, a, I mean, another aspect of it is that the people that I'm currently kind of the representative for um, are all people that, you know, I've been very much involved with like advising them on what they should be doing and connecting them with lawyers and like kind of being like um, a, an added support system. Like one of our people, one of my clients just uh, directed her first episode for Netflix uh, for a show on my block. And and another one of our uh, people who had filmed a short sold it to HBO Max. And so I was like, you know, and a lot of those are coming in either through them or through other people in the collective. And so it's just, you know, you don't get really anywhere in Hollywood alone. And I just wanted to create a system that was more acknowledging of that and sort of uh, kind of held that sacred. And so kind of anything that any sort of agency or management company uh, sort of has that in a, in a form of resource, we kind of like retro uh, we, we kind of like deconstruct it to its most simple parts and figure out the way in which if the industry is interacting with us, it is not any different than what it is from a, another management company. But in, in, on the inside, it works incredibly different. I guess it's like comparative to like a Tesla car compared to a regular oil car. Like they both kind of run on the road, but they, they do very different things on the inside. So again, to understand the process, uh, a client of yours um, goes in for a pitch meeting Say, mm -hmm. right? and yeah. and so they want to make the offer. They call you, you negotiate it. They have no idea how things are divided, what's happening behind this, the scenes, mm -hmm. how things might have been workshopped internally with that writer, with your group. That's all just completely buried, right? All that. Yeah. Stuff. Go in yeah. and you present as a writer, and if they want to make a deal, they call you. You make a deal. Yeah, that's kind of how it operates. And so, and there's other people that like you know represent other people in the group, and so it kind of will like be able to like like a tree sort of like stem off and have other branches and, you know, and in orphanage, we were sort of uh, trying to figure out other ways in which we could help people. And then that made us uh, create these things called Kingdom of Pavement and Kingdom of Ink, which uh, Kingdom of Ink is kind of like a freelancing, ghostwriting, uh, copywriting sort of platform that my uh, co-founder, Amy Sudo, um, had built a, a career out of because she kind of was on the assistant track and she was realizing the, the fruitlessness of it. And so she kind of was like, okay, how do I continue my craft while also being able to make a good amount of money? And so it turned out she was being able to make around six figures uh, for doing this. And that was like incredibly cool. And it even just scales from there. Like you could make a ton of money uh, in, in other industries because people want valuable writers. It's just often incredibly hard to find them. And so we felt like we were uniquely positioned with a ton of talented people in LA to say, hey, here's other ways in which you work 10 hours a week and make more and make double what you would as an assistant working 60 hours. And so is that, is that, have, that uh, operates sort of uh, alongside of what the Orphanage Collective is doing with its five key writer members, right? This is totally. a service that you're providing. You yeah. gauge, people apply, you gauge whether they are suitable and you hook them up with opportunities. And so yeah. that's, the end of it, right? That's a separate you know, totally. thing that you yeah. created to try to help writers support themselves where they're pursuing yeah. other projects. Absolutely. So it's kind of like if we, if we were to think of like, uh, you know, what I call Hollywood 2.0 is this sort of like combination and uh, 
a title I would give to the ecosystem of these three companies. And he and Mavink is kind of like, how do you make a good amount of money to be sort of like creatively sovereign and have financial freedom? Orphanage is essentially like, how do you creatively develop and uh, have a community of people in which you can figure out what's the best version of what you want? And then we have this other thing, Kingdom of Pavement, which is a production company that we use as a, as a white label where we've developed and created all the contracts anybody would ever need. And we have uh, infrastructure for that. So we could essentially use the, the company and the LLC of that. So if somebody wants to make a comic book, somebody wants to make a podcast, whatever, we kind of use that as a white label in order to give them infrastructure so they don't have to do all of that on their own. That allows for them to have uh, the taxes sorted out properly and everything. And so we were figuring that out naturally for our own stuff. And we're like, we should just give this to people as an option that's within our uh, you know, system. So within Orphanage, because it's such a small um, interdependent group, um, mm -hmm. have you sort of settled on one genre? Are you guys all working in a similar kind of mindset? Are you all sci-fi or all drama or all comedy? How is um, that working? Yeah, I think that great storytelling is great storytelling. And I think whether that is a romantic comedy, a erotic thriller or a sci-fi epic, I think it ultimately comes down to when two people are in a spaceship or in a cabin in the woods, uh, what are they saying to each other and what is their life, what are their lives mean to each other. And, um, and so everybody in the group has a lot of different interests. There's one person that's really into whodunits and that's kind of his bread and butter is telling uh, whodunits in the style of like Knives Out. We have another person that really loves uh, telling um, sci-fi fantasy kind of genre bendy things through the Latina perspective. And then, you know, I have another per another person who uh, really loves writing kind of like Isaac Asimov type, uh, you know, prose. And then another person uh, really loves uh, telling, you know, sort of espionage thrillers. And so like, you know, that's sort of the, the collection of various people. And I think all of our perspectives and our sort of, uh, you know, the story centers that we have actually inform and cover a lot of our blind spots. And I think that, you know, we cherish the notes because we have, uh, we have a system and like a framework in which we give notes that is everything I've always seen development executives do badly. I basically did the opposite and they seem to really <laughs> love it. You want to expand on that a little bit? How you, uh, yeah, you I, I, I guess like one. Notes? As a recipient of many bad development notes, I had a little knowing chuckle there. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think like, you know, without having to go too deeply into it, one aspect of the philosophy is that um, is that you are not giving them notes for the story you want it to be, but you are giving them notes based on the story that they want to tell. And you are here to be in service of them. And uh, that means that you need to be lending yourself in a way of thinking like this writer and giving them notes. It's not what you would do if you were to rewrite this thing. It is what are they doing for you to best help them and see what they are creatively missing. So like that's one of them that is a very uh, specific sort of philosophy um, that we go through. And also, um, you know, another thing with notes is sort of like is, is listening and we want to be sort of like shepherds of, of people and like them to us. And so, you know, there's, there's like, you know, some various rules of if you, if you say you don't like anything, if you say you, that something isn't working, you better have a pitch. Um, because there's people that are just like, I just don't like it. Why? I don't know. I just don't like it. And it's just like, why? It's like, I don't know. And then it's just like, just change it. And then you don't know what to do. And so for this, it's just like the rule is it's like if anybody gives a note, you better have an you better have a pitch. And so, you know, that's sort of those are that's like five percent of like the various things that we do. But um So um you said that you were a small group, you expanded and now you've retracted again. Um how how do you pick the members of the collective? What is the process? Or were you all people that knew each other before and kind of came together organically? Do you look for new members? And if so, how do people apply to become a part of your collective? Yeah. Um, orphanage is kind of like, what I realized last year is that we expanded um, and had uh, double the people that we have now. And, and what I was kind of realizing was that like, not all of them were super down for the mission. What they kind of wanted was to kind of uh, extort the services for a certain amount of time and then bail. And, yeah. you know, and then it became a much more present in seeing like, who does that? because we do offer a lot that people really want, but I do think that there's a ton of fear that operates in Hollywood that makes people think that, you know, I get that this is giving me a lot, but I ultimately just want Ari Emanuel to be my agent. Um, 
And so, and if you want that, that's totally fine, but it's like, you know, don't, don't lie to the group. Um, and so what we, what we've been kind of dialing into is figuring out what is, what is like the core DNA seed of orphanage. And what I had to do was sort of like pare back a little bit and sort of figure out like, how do I not overextend myself? And also how do we figure out the, uh, the cooperative nature, nature of the group more seamlessly. And, you know, the way that we get members is everything has to come through a person that's already in orphanage. So somebody has to say like, hey, this person I read, there's, they're really cool. I want to vouch for them and have them submitted to the group. And so there's not like an online portal. But what we also have is Kingdom of Ink, which is a more uh, formalized kind of job situation. And uh, what that is, is, you know, and those people are incredible. So like, you know, what I foresee is that like, if somebody lives in London, and is a writer for us through Kingdom of Ink, and they're extraordinary. There's no reason why they wouldn't be able to be an orphanage. It also kind of gives us much more uh, time to see how they operate, because when you're in a situation, uh, the thing with orphanage is that we all rely on each other, and the group DNA is really important. And so what we get to see with Ink is how people uh, operate as creatives, what is their integrity level, and like, are they reliable? And what is their, what is their writing like? And so we get to see them over a lot of different iterations to kind of pressure test a lot of the things that were kind of invisible for the people that we had in orphanage that weren't meant to be there. Mm -hmm. um, so does someone represent you within the collective? Um, I, I'm not really in, uh, my friend, my, my, my co-partner, Amy Sudo, she like represents me when I need somebody to talk on my behalf, but it's also not like, that's, that's a strategy that other people are using. That's not really the thing that I'm doing now. I'm much more in a place where I have funds and things that I'm doing through freelancing and various like savings that I have in order to make my podcast and to make those things. And like, I, I think that, you know, Amy, Amy can be my representative should other people need to talk to somebody that's not me. Um, but I think the other lens of it is I would rather figure out how to not, how to create an entire system in which somebody can be successful without Hollywood's intervention. And so how do we get somebody to be able to have the money that they need, have the creative environment to create their stuff as on the level that they want and then also have the means of making it because we also have a marketing PR team. And so we would rather just get you from zero to like, you know, 10,000 followers and then just have your environment and your true, fran true fans sort of like uh, fueling your life and your creative existence. And like, how do we get you there? Because that's gonna make you infinitely more valuable to publishers, to executives, to whatever. And so they're almost in my mind thought is like an afterthought. Like, you know, a couple of people have been going out for staffing because people have been reaching out wanting to hire some people. And, you know, the methodology of the group is that we're not like sitting around like hoping about it because we're kind of, we're getting money through other ways and we're able to kind of like let Hollywood do whatever it's going to do. Because if you want, if you're waiting around for Hollywood to save you, you might, you might starve to death. Um, and so that's kind of how uh, we operate, but yeah. Um, Talk about know, the PDMs you're working in, because you've talked about short films and podcasts. Um, yeah. And those are obviously easier things to get produced than, say, a full movie or, or, a, or a series. Do you have aspirations towards having the money to be able to independently produce features and episodic series as well? Yeah. And so um, all of that, like, I think, you know, on, on the topic of mediums that we are interested in, we're, in, we're interested in all mediums. But what we're doing is we're having to be very conscious about like, you know, if we have $10,000, what's the best way to, to make that? Is it better to make a short or is it better to make a five issue arc of a comic book and then get that published? And so it's like, you got to weigh kind of like, what, what do you want? How do you want to deal with that? Or even like $10,000, you could have like a five episode podcast series for that amount of money. And so we kind of like, you know, a lot of people that are currently in this group are long form storytellers. They are people that like TV, they like doing all that. And so they kind of are showrunners of their various shows. And, you know, we are uh, executive producers on various stuff just to aid support. And one of my clients, Jorge uh, Molina, uh, he, he created this podcast uh, that he uh, had pitched us, which was a murder mystery set at the 2021 Oscars. And so we've been basically producing that with him for the past six months. And, you know, the last two episodes come out in the next month. And so what's that called? It, just to be nominated. Oh, just, just to be nominated. Just to be nominated. Yeah. And so, uh, so yeah, so we, we kind of like, we're, we keep thinking about like, what are the best ways to do 
these various things and allow people as writers to have really full experiences. And people are starting to write novels more now because there's not as much as a investment in, uh, you know, the physical production of stuff. And because um, anytime that you get off from words off a page, it immediately becomes more expensive. And so well, and also, I mean, IP is king because the mere mm -hmm. fact that it exists in another medium becomes reassuring to the, the fearful Hollywood thinking, yeah. which is if I take a risk on this and it doesn't work, it's on me. So if it already has been endorsed by a publisher, comic book producer, you know, a podcast, yeah. it makes it easier to sell. It makes yeah, it sell. absolutely. And so it's, uh, yeah, like, yeah, what you, what you just said. And we, we kind of are constantly like, let's stop writing to like show people and let's write to make. And, uh, and so that's kind of the, the energy and everybody that's within our universe owns hundred percent of their IP. Um, and so that's something, cause we think that, cause IP and owning that stuff is essentially like, that is the most valuable asset. And that's, you know, if somebody gives you a hundred thousand dollars for your script, you know, and then they make $8 billion off of it and it's star Wars, like, you know, like that's not, uh, going to help you very much. Um, and so, uh, you know right. what kind of sell to an outside production company yeah. and then you have to transfer your absolutely and so it's like yeah i think hollywood should just be uh an afterthought i don't think it should be really the uh the main focus anymore i think people should just be figuring out how do i make enough money to be uh to be happy healthy secure have mm -hmm. mental health money and being able to have the space and time in my schedule to travel, to see the world, be a person of the world and make the stories that are representative of the people that are in your life and around your life and the things that you see. And I think that that's way more important than uh, being stuck in a windowless office, like, you know, um, basically sorting mail. Well, there's so much changing now too. I mean, I think, you know, because, you know, you can make a podcast, you can shoot it a short on your phone, cut it on your, you know, computer, like, the democratization of equipment um, has really made it much more possible for people to make it. And I, I totally yeah. agree with you that there is this impediment to creativity that is that is mythologized by this Hollywood, pull up your bootstraps. You know, I, I came up the hard way, you have to come up the hard way. You know, you need to work yeah. 18 hours a day in order to succeed. You know, I think all of that is nuts, right? Because I think we need to have a whole life, particularly as writers, because where else are you getting ideas from if you're not living, right? You can't just be, as you say, sitting in a windowless. Totally. So there are a lot of other disruptors. Can you talk a little bit about um, when the Guild, um, you know, had its action against the agencies, against the ATA over packaging fees, um, and many writers, including myself, you know, fired mm -hmm. their at that time. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that you think both impacted writers and the, the industry generally and then also your business? I think that, um, yes, I think, I think with that, I think what's starting to happen is that we, there is, there is more revelations about what value do these people bring us, like truly. And I think that if everybody was happy and felt like the deals were good, like there would be no reason for it. But the problem is, is that it's kind of like, I, I described them as like a bit of like trolls that took over the bridges, you know? And it's like, and they didn't even, they, the bridges weren't theirs to begin with. And they just kind of put themselves there and just started taking money. And so I, I think the post WGA conflict of all of it is, uh, is, is just, you know, I, there's a Malcolm X quote uh, that is like, you know, that feels kind of comparable to this is that like uh, racism doesn't go away. It's like a Cadillac. It just gets a new model every year. Is that like, you know, everything kind of exists on a plate. And if you move something off of that side of the plate, we're like, I'm really upset that this is here. There's like, okay, we'll take it off there, but it's still on the plate. And so with, uh, with that or the Malcolm X quote, it's just kind of like what they were doing isn't gone it's just been manifested in a different way. And I think the thing that is gonna be the major thing that everybody has to look at in the next five years is managers. Mm -hmm. Because what they're doing is that a lot of agents are like, why don't we just like give up the agent thing and just go to management because there's less, less oversight and we're able to cut and there's no sort of like, a, nobody. there's no test to be a manager. You just are, you just say you are. And yeah, and so 
you know, they're able to put themselves on as producers. They're able to do a lot of things that is kind of operating in the shadows. And it's a, it's a very, very scary situation that to say like some of the worst uh, perpetrators of the things that the, the WGA had problems with, those people are now our managers. And I think that that's uh, something definitely to keep an eye out because um, yeah, they're just, they're kind of just taking everything. And, and so orphanage wasn't like something that I felt like I, I, I woke up, uh, you know, as a five-year-old and it's like, I want to be a manager someday. I just saw it as like, uh, as an inevitability to create, uh, you know, all of this stuff that I'm doing is like, I genuinely just want people to be happy and I want people to feel valued. And I think that like, you know, I've worked for a lot of really high up people who should be the happiest people on the planet. And the spoiler alert is, is that they aren't. They're in a system that exploits them and hurts them. And uh, they could be discarded in a second and they would have no say over it. And that's really scary. And that's really sad. And that's often why they treat their people coming up the way that they do yeah. is because there's so much fear and anxiety in it. And I, I just genuinely want people to be happy as creatives. And I think that that's not, you know, Vincent van Gogh, like basically just like went mentally insane and started like hacking at parts of himself until he died. And I, I don't want that for my friends. I don't want that for creatives. I want them to be happy, you know. I think it's interesting because, um, you know, I think that agents, as you say, became a bridge because they were conduit of information, right? They were the mm -hmm. guardians of information. They had access to whatever was hot or good or new, right? And they became yeah. a funnel into the buyers. And I think that, you know, the internet age has just completely destroyed that need for, you know, for those barriers, right? I mean, totally. you know that during the ATA action, people are like, oh, how are shows going to staff? And, you know, shows just staff because, well, on TV, writers hire other writers anyway, yeah. right? So, and if they needed to, the fr I had friends who were running shows, they hired someone to wade through the piles of scripts, mm -hmm. right? But they, there was no impediment to the piles of scripts coming in, right? And I think no. that that is really why, because I, I think you're right. I've had a number of agents over the course of my career. I have an excellent manager, uh, but that's the only time I've ever felt like I had a partner in my career. I think agents are transactional. I think you're right. They service their top percentage of clients because that's where they make the most money. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I know a lot of people maintain that they have, again, information because they have, you know, someone who's covering every studio who's gathering information. But, I, yeah. you know, I think that you're right. You can sit around and wait to hear about information about a job you might be right for that maybe you could get your agent to put you up for. Or you can take that energy and go out and make something, which... Mm -hmm you know, will feed your soul. Absolutely. I think a lot of, I think what the agencies don't want people to know is that their entire jobs can be replaced with a website. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, that's incredibly true. It's, it's just like with Comcast, right? Like Comcast would have loved for none of us to be on streaming or on the internet. They would have loved us to just be on cable forever. Um, and they actually bought up companies that were in threat of that and basically just dis, like disassembled, like disassembled them. And I think like Hollywood is is very prehistoric in how it operates because it doesn't actually its innovation kind of isn't dictated by need. It's kind of controlled by the like the 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 royalty that is inside of it. And uh, even if it could be better, they won't let it be better because it will relinquish some level of control from them. Well, because agents used to have the power of information and studios yeah. used to have the power of distribution neither of those things are true anymore, right? Totally. I mean, so that's, you know, it's changed the, the game entirely. Absolutely. Um, so, so what about the, and I just want to remind people that you can drop questions in the Q&A or the chat, we'll get to them, but um, what about the pandemic? I mean, obviously, you know, we're all, you know, I hate people when they say, how are they going? Oh, fine. I'm like, no, no one's fine. We all have PTSD and we're living through hell, although there is at least, you know, uh, a glimmer of light on the other side, but um, you know, how did the pandemic affect your business? And um, do you think, and I think this is a, it'd be really interesting to hear your perspective of this. Do you think that, that the kind of thinking that the, the pandemic has engendered will create more disruptors like you in this space who are just going to say, you know what, I was cooped up at home for 14 months staring my hair out and fuck it, I'm just going to, oh, pardon my language, I'm just going to go and make things, or I'm just going to go and do stuff, or I'm going to, I'm tired of the system that's keeping me down. What do you think about that? 
Yeah, I think like, you know, what I often say is like 2020, fuck you, but thank you. Uh, because I think that it, uh, it sort of created this space where people could self-reflect. Because like some people just like end up in a mail room and then they blink and then they're 35 years old and they're a CE somewhere and they're not getting promoted and their boss just let them go. And I'm like, you know, they kind of distract you in that way because they keep you, you know, underfed, under-resourced and not with enough time to think because they just want you to go through your entire life doing what they want you to do until you just blip out of existence. Um, and so I think the thing that like this did, which has been an enormous gift to myself and I, I'm infinitely happier now post-COVID than I was in a pre-COVID world because I was able to actually take a second. It was kind of like an elimination diet. And I realized all the things that were poisoning me. And so I was like, oh man, that like is really bad. Or just going on generals into oblivion where it's just like, oh, I'll have 200 generals and maybe somebody will make my dream come true. Such a waste of time. Like it's, it's, they're not able to do that. And I think like also from a writer, there's this thing that Chris McQuarrie who, who directs like, you know, all the Mission Impossible movies. What he says is that uh, screenplays don't get movies made. Directors get movies made. And screenplays are the afterthought of a studio's decision to make a movie. So they're like, we have this person and this person, like they want to do something like this. Does anybody have something that's like that? And they're like, here. And then that's how a movie gets made. And so. I think that's more true in um, features than in TV and in streaming where I think, I mean, I think it's, it's less, um, I, I still think there's a lot of arbitrary reasons about why stuff gets bought and made. But I do I, I, the ability yeah. that streamers are, and cable have given us to do sort of niche programming that's, you know, named at, aimed at a more narrow demographic than the full four quadrant mm -hmm. extravaganza that every feature seems to now need to be in order to justify its cost, right? So I think that, totally. you know, there is room for, you know, more defined, um, you know, more narrowly defined material. Well, what I'm seeing in TV is it's being kind of co-opted by the feature film people because there's only 10 movies being made a year from each studio and there's only four of them now. And so like, what does everybody else do with their time is that they're going to do TV. And what you'll also start to see is that like the idea of like the all powerful showrunner, like Matt Weiner, or Damon Lindelof or David Chase or, you know, Genji Cohen, like those people are like of a grandfathered in position because they all had shows when nobody was really caring about television. They were sort of there and they created value where a lot of people thought it was this second rate thing like how people kind of think about web series right now like yeah it's a thing like that's you know whatever you know they're not making movies they're not making cinema well, and well, I think beginning to transfer like high maintenance which started on vimeo yeah. went to hbo you know i mean i think that totally what i urge people when i'm teaching writing is to think about like how does your story best live? You know, is it best told in mm -hmm. 10 minute increments, half an hour, hour, you know, one 90 minute sweeping rush? You have to kind of decide yeah. what's the best thing for the content and then decide on top of that, what's the best platform or, you know, way to get it yeah. made. Yeah, yeah. So like even from that perspective, like what you tell your students, like I, I would add on to that, which is like, you know, what's the best version of this? And I would say whatever version that makes it real in the quickest amount of time. And, uh, and so, you know, that kind of that, but like with TV, like Netflix runs their shows now, basically, like the showrunners are kind of like conduits of the executives, because those people are more the showrunners now. And I think we're seeing that a lot more is that, uh, you know, Amazon and these companies that are sort of kind of trying to process why Hollywood operates the way that it does, and they're trying to make it make more sense. And so that's why like Netflix goes through how many people it goes through. And yeah. The book that's really fascinating is the guy who started it, Reed Hastings, wrote a book called The No Rules Rules, mm -hmm. which I think is a very interesting look at the psychology of Netflix. It's kind of like a meat grinder that's just trying to make more efficient and automize sort of like a development process. And so they are the true tech company, yeah. uh, tech content company. Algorithm defined material, which I, yeah. like, I, I just, I mean, I think that eliminates something really vital about the creative process, you know, I mean, totally. you know, I think that, you know, the people that I really admire were the people who, you know, bet on their guts, you know, like, yeah. they just had a sense of like, I'm going to bet on this filmmaker, I'm going to bet on this story, I'm going to take a risk. I think that Hollywood is so risk averse now. It's, totally. Uh, it Like I watched the movie, The Player, which is, which is great, like yeah. a year ago. Yeah. 
And it was so funny watching that because everybody's just like, okay, I have a pitch for you. It's about this person. They love their dog, but their dog is like, you know, just terrible, but they actually like fall in love with a cat. And then there's like, it's like, good, send it to the next person. And it's so funny because like in that world, like in the nineties, like that's very much how it operated is that they were just like, everybody was pitching all the time, all this original stories. And I'm just, and I was watching that now and I was like, wow, that doesn't happen really anymore. Like everybody's just like, so is somebody doing something with that? Well, can I hear about the Marvel movie? You know, and that's like it. Or it looks like how many deals were set up about um, the Robin Hood uh, GameStop story. Yeah. I mean, totally. you know, I think there were seven projects, narrative and docs, and up and set up about yeah. that within two weeks after that story broke. And you think, okay, that's seven projects. Like, who, how does that work? You know, like, Who's going to watch all seven of those? Probably not me, maybe one, but you know. Well, everybody's in a race to get financing and the right stars. And then whoever goes first will make everybody else cower. And so it's like, it's like, it's basically just a race to uh, financing, you know? So what do you think at this juncture in time, what do you think are both the biggest challenges and the biggest opportunities for writers as we emerge from this pandemic period into a brave new world? What do you think are, what do you think yeah. are the opportunities and where do you think we're going to be challenged? I hope that people see how Hollywood operates more, like see it more for what it is. And I think like, and understand, you know, and also like, you know, I, I often talk to people that are coming up or trying to enter the industry or they cold reach out to me. And a lot of them are just like, you know, a lot of people think that they want to be the exceptions. Like and they're what, like, oh, like in what sense, like, like what they would say would be like, I get that 99% of people don't succeed in Hollywood or whatever the number is. And they're like, but I could be the 1%. And I think like nobody goes to war thinking that they're going to be the one that dies. And otherwise nobody would probably go. And so, um, so what a lot of people go is that there's just like this gigantic sort of, I don't know, there's this like system. I, what, what I hope people get coming out of COVID is more uh, understanding their own value. What is, what is the ability to have freedom to walk your dog during the day on a Tuesday to like be able to like, you know, write the book that you've been writing to write, like driving up the coast that you've never really been able to see because you've been landlocked to LA. I hope this has given people more time to see that there's a big world out there and a lot of cool things and a lot of amazing people. And I think that we can create all the things we ever wanted to do. Um, we just, we should just get more creative about it. And I think, a lot of people, I think what, I think the thing is, is that a lot of people say that they want to be showrunners, but the thing is, is that they don't, they don't want to write. People want to be movie stars, but they don't want to be actors. People want job titles. They, they, don't, they don't want jobs. And so when you're dealing with that, you're kind of in, encountering a lot of hypocrisy where people think that they are, uh, where they think that they're being genuine in what they want to do. And a lot of what my ecosystem and mantra is about is just like, let's make it. And then somebody's like, well, like, could we maybe save it, send it to HBO? And I'm like, why do you need HBO for it? Mm -hmm. Like, let's make it, let's just go make it. And it's like, I don't know, I just feel like I need this or that. I'm like, the, the thing that you think that you need is not the thing that you need to make this. What you want is validation. What you want is to be able to say, hey, mom and dad, guess what? Disney got my thing. Aren't you so proud of me? Hey, like, you know, they all want to like date actors or they want to like be these like these titans of cinema where they sit next to Leo and like, you know, they're just like these glammed out people. And I'm like, what you, what that isn't, that has nothing to do with creating nothing anything. With That's, That's just you wanting validation. Creativity either. It's yeah. Like, it's actually the antithesis of creativity. Absolutely. And so I think like, and it's also like that gets into social games and comparison and, you know, like that comparison is a thief of joy. Like, I think that's a lot of why. Um, are there any other uh, organizations that operate the way the orphanage does to your knowledge? Is there any other collectives that are operating? Not that I'm aware of. And I, and, you know, to be honest, like I, I, if they were, that'd be really cool. I just, from what I've seen in the level of hardship and specifically somebody that's like myself, who's, you know, written for, for things and like gotten my list, my scripts on lists. And there there's, I, I just feel like, I, there might not be anybody crazy enough to do what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> yeah. What are you most excited about that's upcoming for your various organizations and endeavors? We have actually something that I'll plug that uh, will be out in a month is 
something that I've been uh, creating with uh, my partner, Amy Sudo, is this thing called the Nowhere Room, which the is room. the Nowhere Room, which is a, it, it's an unscripted podcast that basically follows us in our first year of businesses. And it's sort of like all of us uh, encountering uh, random things that we're dealing with and like, in, even in producing our own stuff. So it's like everything that we kind of like end up talking about, like sometimes on these calls or with other people, we're like, why don't we just aggregate all that information so we never have to tell our origin story again? That if somebody is genuinely wanting to absorb what our realities are and the people and the advice that we've learned from the people that we've worked for, or what we're doing now, um, how do we create all of the context for somebody to have a fulfilling creative life? And like, you know, what, what Amy and I are doing is not, it's not special in as much as we're, we're the only ones I'm aware of that are doing it. Um, but it is, it does not take uh, extraordinary uh, things to make this stuff. It's just about deciding to make it. And so where's that going to live the nowhere room? Where can it'll be a podcast. So um, we have, uh, we have over a hundred episodes basically wow. completely uh, <laughs> recorded and it's we have really about you charting your adventures of getting the business up and running. And how yeah. long are the episodes? Uh, we're going to be releasing two a week. So they'll be anywhere between four minutes to 20 minutes. Oh, so shortish, just little like. Yeah, stuff. kind of like bite size, like things that while you're doing your laundry, you can listen to it because, um, you know, like I'm sure like what you've experienced is when anybody comes to you and says like, Nina, tell me about your life and all these experiences. I'm sure you've told the same story hundreds of times. And uh, yeah, and yeah, the Noah room, N-O-W-H-E-R-E -E room. And so that will be all found through like Kingdom of Pavement, which is a production company that I'm involved with. And so we've been producing that. And so you that will be- drop any, uh, you know, website information or whatever <laughs> for any of your organizations in the chat. I'm sure our attendees would be happy. Let me see, panelists, uh, panelists, attendees. Cool. Okay, here. Um, I'm gonna do that in the chat. So yeah, so the Nowhere Man, Nowhere Room, yeah. Um, Kingdom of Pavement is your production company, right? And then yeah, so currently on there right now is uh, The Last Station, which is a show that uh, I co-share run with my business partner, Amy Sudo, and then uh, Just Be Nominated is on there, and uh, Nowhere Room will basically be coming up through that about mid-June. But kind of all the things that we're talking about is literally just the dozens of hours of us basically breaking down all those concepts and our experiences and why we're making the decisions that we're making. Um, so what, I mean, you've, you've kind of, you came out here, you wanted to be a writer, right? Is that, mm -hmm. was that, is your path? And is that still your dream? I mean, if you got the opportunity to go run your show, would that be the thing that would make you the happiest? Or are you finding that, you know, as you sort of segued into other, these other businesses, you're finding a different kind of gratification? Yeah, I think I like, um, great question. I, I feel Hmm. I would say that I'm, well, in a lot of ways, I'm already running my own shows. And so even today we wrote episode nine of Last Station. And so like, and then we're going to have those last four episodes come out in probably late summer. Um, I've been writing a, a show called uh, The Horror at Martin's Beach, which is an adaptation of a Lovecraft uh, short story that's loosely, loosely based on that, but takes place within the Cthulhu myth mythos that is about a, uh, Kind of like a rush party for for a frat and sorority um, that takes place at a beach where they arrive and everybody that's supposed to be there for the party is missing and it's kind of this gigantic kind of story that explores the horrors of Greek life and uh, also the cosmic horrors of H.P. <laughs> Lovecraft and you know how do we reflect the horrors that are within and so I've written all 10 episodes of that 50 60 pages each uh, episode and so I'm currently writing the finale right now and so that will be and we have our whole cast. And so we're going to probably start filming that in June. So I've that's written. You're doing also as a podcast or is a. Yeah, that's a podcast. So uh, Just Be Nominated, Last Station, Nowhere Room, and Martin's Speech are all podcasts. And so, um, yeah, I've been like in the past year, I've written more than I've ever written in my life. Like literally I could take all of my scripts that I've written for other people. And I've writ probably written probably a thousand pages of script pages this past year. Um, I'll give a little plug because in the fall we're going to be offering a discovery session of four week class on writing for audio. Um, cool. Taught by another alum uh, by the name of uh, another Tish alum by the name of Emil Stern. Um, there'll be information upcoming of that, but we do have some questions from the audience. 
Cool. Um, so from Giannis, um, whose last name I'm not going to try. Tsitsilakis, I think. I don't know. If I butchered that, I apologize. How do you get your ideas in terms of assessing popularity, appeal to audience, et cetera? How do you do your proverbial market research? Market research. You know, I would say, uh, I, I imagine what that person is is asking is about how do we decide what we choose to make and what we want to do. Um, I I would say we don't really focus on that. We don't, we, we're not, we're going based off of like what we like because we're human beings and chances are if like the eight of us in our group like it, then chances are there are going to be eight to 800, 800 whatevers uh, that would also like it. And so, you know, and I think that, you know, market research, like, you know, I feel like there's a lot of ways to go about this, but we study the things that we're most interested in. We are, if, if it's mutual aid or if it's like, what is like the, what is, how do you create a marketing team? What in a social environment, how do you hack a uh, social influence? And, uh, and I think that I, yeah. So it's like, you know, we go with things that was like, that's really fucking cool. And if we like all feel like, like super like vibrating, excited about it, we do it. And also we have to acknowledge it's like, is this the right thing to do? Is this thing not working? How do we like pivot? And so we do that a lot. And I think the thing with a lot of our, the thing that's really cool, honestly, that was kind of like what you were talking about earlier, Nina, is like the thing that we, that I kind of cherish the most from what this past year, couple years in running these companies have done for me is allowed me to own my failures. Hmm. And that's because, awesome. and because like when you're working for somebody else, it's their problem, you know, if you mess up. If anything goes wrong, like production wise, like financing wise, like marketing wise, like there's nobody to blame but us. Like, and so it's nice to be like, there's nowhere else, there's no way to pass blame. I accept the blame. But the thing that you get to do when you fail is that you actually get closer to succeeding. Is that the more that you fail, the better you're gonna get. And so can you cross the threshold of failing to actually get to the place where you're good? And, um, and so that's something that often people are very uh, kind of scared of, but, you know, we aren't, we weren't born that way. We were taught fear. We weren't like ingrained with it. As a child, you basically fell over a bajillion times trying to walk and you didn't feel bad about yourself. You didn't tell yourself what a piece of shit you were. You're just like, no, I'm going to walk and it's going to hurt. And my, my legs are like this, but I see what I want and I'm going to keep going. And often like, you know, to be moving and walking, you have to accept that life will be imbalanced in order to do that. And so I, I like the idea of like failing until you succeed. And I think we should create more avenues in which it's, it's okay to fail. If like, you know, if it's <laughs> so long as it doesn't hurt a bunch of people. <laughs> yeah. As long as it doesn't hurt other people, but I, I, I agree with you. I'd say, I, I would say I've learned more from my failures than I have from any of my successes hands down. I, you know, totally. You allow yourself to be reflective as opposed to defensive about your failures. You can yeah, it's like you should just see it as a time for growth. Like it, the best ideas that have come up in orphanage, any of the kingdom companies has always been, this is working and I don't know why it's work, not working, but we need to figure out how to make it work. And those are where the best ideas come from is be like, wow, we thought that was going to work. It did not work. And now we know how a better idea of what to do. Also recognizing that, you know, creation of narrative is not a straight line. I think this is what, you know, people feel like they have to produce. They like get they're caught up on how many pages they're generating or how many words they're generating a day. And, you know, some of my most successful days, I don't get a page, you know, word on the page, but I did a lot yeah. of really good thinking, you know, and I figured out, you know, like the next three chapters. And then, you know, that is as vital. You know, I think that Hollywood really encourages this kind of competitive, you know, external uh, rubric for how much you're achieving, which I think is very yeah. unhealthy and, and against the nature of the artist, really. Yeah. And even like when you're not pen to paper, you're still writing because you're like, you're at your coffee shop and you're like, oh shit, like that's what the person's that's actually doing. Nice. It's like, or you're like, you're going on a walk with your dog and your dog just like freaks out over like a rabbit, but then like really wants to be like its best friend. And you're like, oh, that's what this, this thing should do. It's like by living life and being in life, your brain is constantly writing. It's, it's like, you know, you just have a bunch of programs running in the back of your head. And um, that's why I think it's like, yes. I don't know, people should be kind to themselves uh, 
and allow it to come as it is. Well, I, I too, I'm always telling people always ask me about my process and they say, do you know, do you demand that you write every day? Well, no, you know, do you write, yeah. you, you know, do you, do you have a certain number of pages you feel you have to get done in a session? No, you know, like I just yeah. feel like you're doing all of those things are setting up an external pressure that you're just bound to fail yourself. So why do that? Yeah. It's like the lack of it's the opposite of self-compassion to set up. Yeah. Also, people like work in different ways. Like even like uh, Amy Sudo, who I run class station with, like she's really good. Like she likes to work things out on the page. I very much like to work things out in mind and pitching so that when we get into the page, we know what it's doing. And, but like it actually accommodates both of us because she's really good at creating a first draft and then I'm able to imprint upon it. And so there's kind of a, a lot of uh, different versions, a, a lot of ways to skim the cat. But the thing that's super exciting is that you know, if you're creative or whatever your process is, is that you get to figure out what your process is. Do you like listening to music? Do you like being in a coffee shop? Do you like being in complete silence? Do you like writing at night? Do you like writing first thing in the morning? Like, do you want an outline? Do you want no outline? You know, like, do you want people to do a table read for it? Do you not need that? Are you a prose writer? Are you like a screenplay writer? Like, do you just want to write comic books? Like, do you just want to be a, a spoken word poet? You can be whatever, you know? And I, and I have to say that I've discovered, you know, really, you know, later in my life, a real love of writing prose and novels after a career in TV that really surprised me how much I loved it, you know? Yeah, because it's like, I imagine- Audience question, okay? Oh yeah, let's do it. Unless I interrupted you. Do you have something you wanted to say? No, I, I, I have okay, nothing okay. important, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, all right, so in an industry which is super competitive, judgmental, predatory, all true, does humility and sincerity help or are they handicaps? Do you have any advice on how to tread the slippery path of being assertive and cutthroat being versus humble? Although I wouldn't, I'm just gonna say, Yanni, that I don't think you wanna put assertive and cutthroat it together because there's a difference between those two, but then I'm gonna turn it over to Kyle. What advice do you have okay. about moving in your authentic, sincere self through this world? advice for being your authentic severe or your authentic sincere self or a cutthroat version of yourself um you know i i think that 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 question is you know trying to process that question is also trying to say like you know in the typical hollywood is hollywood cutthroat yes do i believe that it should be no do I think that people should uh, change themselves in order to uh, be able to be incorporated into Hollywood? No. Um, do I do I think too many people do that? Yes. I think that you know you should you should do what makes you the most happy. And I think the problem is is that Hollywood attracts a lot of people with very low self esteem, and so that they would sooner choose the industry over their own selves and their own happiness. And I think that. Uh, I think that you should be determined. I think you should have follow through. I think you need grit to get through things because there's a lot of things that are just hard just because they're hard. Making anything out of nothing is going to be hard. And so, no, I think you should be a good person. But I also think that the industry doesn't really make anybody anything other than more of what they are. And, uh, and I think that that's, you know, that's, that's kind of the thing that I've seen. And so my advice is just like, no, be a good person. And I think like if you're in a situation where it feels like that op operating or working for a person or being in a space is compromising of what the type of person you want to be, quit. And I think that a lot of people think like, well, I can't quit and I have to do all these things. And it's like, you can find work anywhere. It's just a matter of like, how do you do it? How do you go about it? And uh, are you going to put the work in? Um, I think that the culture is changing somewhat. I mean, I think you know, I'm a little older than you. And when I was coming up, there was, you know, very much this sort of, I suffered, so you should suffer too kind of mentality, right? I paid yeah. my dues, right? So whether that meant you worked in a shitty job or you, you know, were the, you know, like as an assistant or you're the junior person in a writer's room and took abuse yeah. or, or whatever it was, you know, you were kind of expected to take it because that was the system. And I really feel like that allowed, you know, some of the epic bullies of our time, the Weinsteins and Rudins, you know, to get away yeah. with it. Like it was as long as, as long as they were making hits, no one cared. And I think that people care now. And I think that, you know, I, I hope certainly that people are more willing to say what, you know, what, this is not acceptable. I will not be in an abusive environment and have, a, yeah. like, have agency to do that, to quit and to move on or to speak up in a place where they're at because, you know, as you were yeah. talking about before, we have not taken some time to reflect on our 
ourselves and what's important in our lives over the past 15 months. And it's been a, a wasted time. Yeah. And I guess to, to, to close on, on this, you know, what you had just said, which I think is, is really uh, important to note, like, you know, abuse is a, is a circular system. Um, you know, people absorb what their environment is and then it becomes unconscious because that's just what you've learned. And so you have to have an intense amount of like focus on your blind spots and trying to acknowledge the things that happen that you might not entirely understand through therapy or whatever. I think the thing with the industry is that, yeah, like they got rid of Weinstein and now they, they recently gave the green light on Rudin. But I would say that there are people that I know of that are incredibly bad people that are still being protected by this industry. Like even, you know, I've seen what it's like for um, PR company or PR uh, people like that are inside companies that are literally like kind of almost like doing these like bids or like saying like, I know you have stuff on that person. Please don't release that right now because it's going to, it's going to mess up okay. Batman or whatever, you know? And then, so they're like, can you hold off on it? Like the, the various publications had, it's no, it's no, uh, it's no mystery to anybody that uh, Scott Rudin is a, is a bad person. Um, and they've had, and they've had that stuff for years, literally since the Weinstein thing. And, you know, a lot of the major agencies had to say, like, we have too many projects with him to, like, literally get rid of him. Weinstein didn't really have anything, and he was getting more cumbersome than he was worth. And so they, like, sacrificed him to the wolves. They sacrificed him to, like, the social media gods to appease them because, like, they needed a sacrifice. And I think that Rudin got to the point where he didn't have enough in development with people that they were able to let him go. There's still a lot of people that are really not great people that they're protecting, and they're basically... Uh, trading favors with, uh, whether it's big companies trying to protect Joss Whedon, for, for instance, like he's had stuff that's been being collected by them for five years and, uh, you know, and like HBO is protecting him. And so there's just like a lot of these things where it's like, and it makes sense, like that's their asset. That's their, the person that they're trying to protect. And, you know, for somebody to have this person that's been in charge with like a billion dollars worth of content for them, um, they want to protect that. And then it just gets to the point where they just can't and they have to let it go. But I, I do see the weeding out happening, but I do think that like certain people are getting more, more clever about how they hide their, their shitty parts. Yeah, I think, I mean, it does ultimately come down to economics. I think it was the same thing with Kevin Spacey, right? It becomes when it's yeah. no, no, everyone's not making enough money off the person to justify hiding anymore is when it goes. But I, I, I actually hold hope because you know, I feel like the, you know, upcoming generation of people are really, look, the people entering the industry now, like you, um, have a very different perspective and just say, hell no, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to put myself in an abusive situation. I'm not going to tolerate a job where someone's throwing an ashtray at me. I'm going to figure out how to go make my stuff because I want to go make stuff. You know, I think it was really fascinating, even in terms of how the award shows don't seem to matter anymore. No one cares. Yeah. You know, I mean, and I, I think that's interesting because I wonder, you know, if, if they're not vehicles for marketing, which they are no longer because they're not getting the audiences, therefore they're not selling the product to the audiences. Yeah. Do they sustain? Do they actually continue? Because maybe they can't. Maybe it's just, if it's just about actor ego, maybe there's no, you know, value in it anymore. Yeah. So, I feel like we're on the cusp of a lot of change, actually. And I hope that it's, um, you know, I hope it's more towards a more equitable, less abusive, more inclusive kind of thinking across the board in the industry. And I, so I really Thank admire you what you're doing. I hope you keep bringing it. Thanks, um, Nina. We have a comment, it's not a question, but from Christina Wren. I love what you guys are doing. I started a production company with my partner 12 years ago. And we do things in a similar way as you describe. It's affirming to hear you speak because sometimes I wonder if we should be figuring, fighting more to get inside the system. It's wonderful to picture fellows out there creating in a similar way. And I wish you guys the very best. So that's- oh, I wish you the very best as well. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I think like the question of like, how much should we be in the industry or, or, or operate outside of it? I think like, I think so long as you're making things and making money, like why do you need to operate in it? Because you want Brad Pitt in your, your TV show. Like, or, you know, like it's like, there's a lot of things. There's talented people out the, like the wazoo everywhere. And I think some of the most talented writers, actors, people I've experienced 
are people that have just never been given a shot. Mm-hmm. And I, and I, and you know, genuinely, like they're not just people like, oh, if they did, if they were quality, they would observe it. You know, I, I think a lot of the way that Hollywood operates is like a lottery system to bring that metaphor back. And I think the there's a, an intense amount that goes into making Brad Pitt, Brad Pitt. And uh, are there a lot of people that are comparable and could have done what Brad Pitt did? Yeah, I think so. Mm-hmm. He's just the chosen one. And so I, I don't want to operate in a world where I have to pray to be Harry Potter. I just want to be a person that can choose to be Harry Potter. And everybody has the ability to choose. We should stop we should stop fixating so much on being chosen. And I think Hollywood operates around the narrative of like, wait until you're chosen or you are the chosen one. And if you notice a lot of how these people tell their stories, whether it's Fincher or Spielberg, they all have these like, I was chosen uh, narratives, which are very toxic because it keeps the people that should be fighting subservient and waiting when they should be fighting and creating. And so I, uh, I wanna create more of a world of doers and I honestly am incredibly happy with uh, what even I've been able to accomplish and the various people that I work with and what they've been able to accomplish. And even, you know, we often constantly say to ourselves, can you imagine what a year is going to be like from now? And, you know, if I were to look back at what we were a year ago to what we are now, we're in an infinitely better place. We have more resources, more connections, more things figured out. You know, I like I'm, I'm staying in a beautiful place in Washington because we shows this is our mobile office. There is there is not there is no preset way of how life uh, is supposed to be, and I think that we can uh, make it whatever we want and do it with people that we want. And there's there's no real need to wait anymore. Uh, everything else is just parting, kind of like fear. Parting advice for the listeners be to just go out there and make it. Just like follow your, just go do. Is that like you know I, that was sort of my last question is. You know, what would be your best advice for people trying to break in? And, and do you think it's, it's, is it to stop trying to break in, just, you know, break out? Is that, that would be? Uh, I like that. I, I might co-op that. Uh, stop break, yeah, break out. Uh, but I, I think that, um, you know, whenever I heard people say like, don't worry about that, just do it. Like I, I had such anger in my body for that person. Cause I was just like, they just don't get it. And I don't, they're not giving me any resources. There's no there's no real uh, track for that. And so, you know, what I would do is a slightly more nuanced version of what that advice is. And I would say, if you're a, re- if you're a writer, if you're a creative or whatever, and if you don't have outside uh, family supporting you and you need to make money, there's an incredible uh, resource called the internet. And what we have done with our people and what my business partner, Amy Sudo did is she built a six figure career off of Upwork, which is a freelance services where you could be a, a ghostwriter, a copywriter, a blog writer, a bio writer. If you're a writer, you can also be, if you're a graphic designer, you can like basically post your services on there and uh, you could start to build your things. And I would say like, you know, go on there, put $20 an hour and then uh, apply for jobs and then just like get one job. And then if you fill up your plate, then go to 40 hours, then get to 65 within a four months. And then you can make $65 an hour, work two days a week. And then you would be making infinitely more than half of Hollywood. And so I would say go there and then also just like save your money um, and then like make the stuff if you really want to make it because if you don't believe enough in your idea to put everything on the line to make it then nobody else will and so uh, do that and also like I'm like available somebody feels like that they don't know how to what are all the steps that you need to have in order to make a podcast like I can I'd be more than happy to tell anybody how that operates. And you it comes down to your contact in the chat too as well. Yeah, I can, I can. Um, um, and a lot of do, a lot, like a lot of what I'm uh, doing is just trying to illuminate a very dark forest because nobody kind of like wants to tell you these things because they want you to kind of exist in the dark. There's also a really cool uh, uh, speech that Mark Duplass did at South by Southwest in like 2015. It's called the Calvary is not coming speech. And it was very informative to me. You could watch the first 25 minutes of that. Uh, and it will kind of like tell, tell, tell you, anybody that's watching kind of everything you need to know about like kind of how Hollywood operates and how you can operate in spite of it and like not listening to it. I think that's really good. There's also anything that Chris McQuarrie talks about is incredibly good. There's this Brian Koppelman or whatever, the guy that does uh, Billions. He has a podcast and there's an episode with Chris, Chris McQuarrie that's like about two hours and they 
they just break down everything. Chris, Chris McQuarrie like wrote for the usual, wrote the usual suspects, won the Oscar for it, and he still can't get his movies made. And so he's very honest. And I love people that are honest that have had that much uh, insight into the industry. And so I would say, uh, go check those things out. And, um, and then if you guys want to check out the Nowhere Room, check out the Nowhere Room in, in, in a couple of weeks. <laughs> um, okay, I see one more question. Very cool. interesting regarding the freelance advice you mentioned. Do you think it's better to go through unions or guilds? Unions and guilds or build from the bottom up? I don't know. Are the are the are unions and guilds applicable to some of that freelance work? No, right. That's no, you can do it for you can do it for nothing. You just basically put yourself on there, and then say and then have a couple things that you have written. And if you want to do like for instance, like a, a, like our bread and butter is memoir. And so uh, the thing that uh, we're very good at, you know, and what we've been brought up for is, you know, we were trained to be able to write for television and write in other people's voices. And a comparable skill for that is like how do you write somebody's story in their voice. And so, uh, you know, my business partner, Amy, like she created an entire career out of that. And it was incredibly inspiring to see. And I was like, how we should do this more because it is better for people to uh, be writing because that you'll learn more as a writer doing this than getting somebody's coffee. And so why don't we just get somebody that can start in and with Kingdom of Ink, we, we're accepting applications. So if anybody is on here and wants to apply, you can go to kingdomofink.com and apply. Um, but we have a stable of uh, 15 people right now that we're currently kind of like getting jobs for and like sort of like giving them materials where they can figure out how to write bios, how to write these various things, how to deal with clients. And we kind of have this community where of freelancers where we're able to kind of like share information and overcome the challenges that we could never do by ourselves or it would take an entire lifetime to figure out for one person. And so we kind of want to get smarter and truly create a community around freelancers that's never really existed before. One of the things that I'm seeing is that there um, does seem to be a, um, this collective feeling of like, I've, I've gained this information, I want to share it, not I want to hold on to it, you know, I mean, yeah. we're, um, again, to tout NYULA a little, we're going to, we have a couple of really exciting things coming up, including something called um, holistic fundraising, how to gain power and raise money without losing your soul, and that's from- I love that title. Yes, yeah, <laughs> She's great. That's going to be with a woman with named Wendy Wexel, but she's another Tish grad and her business is actually, she coaches um, high net worth entrepreneurs and founders on, um, on uh, management skills and, and developing their, their brands. And she said, I want to figure out a way to share this more widely. Right. And I think that, that, and what you're doing, you know, with your, your generosity, I feel like that is all indicative of a new, era which is saying i'm not going to keep it so close to the vest just because i have doesn't mean that you can't have i mean maybe this is optimistic of me kyle i don't know but I, i'd like to believe that we are moving towards a place where people are actually looking to support one another and help one another professionally yeah. as well as otherwise as, as opposed to tearing each other down yeah i i agree and i think also like don't ever let your don't ever let one bad apple spoil your generosity because it's like, you know, the, the, the fact of like showing your ankle to some snakes is that some snakes are going to bite and then you'll know not to put your ankle around them anymore. And I think that a lot of us like kind of grow these garden of contacts throughout our whole life of people. And the thing that's been really interesting about having my own businesses is that I gave a lot of opportunities to those people and saw them like implode and not be able to do it. And so I was kind of like storing these contacts and resources and people I'd met. And I was like, oh, when I have a production company or I have something, I'm going to give all these people work. I literally went through that just this past year and like I, I blew apart 90% of my environment. And, and what I found was, is that often the things that you, that you're growing for the future that you think you're going to have at some point is like in a garden that's kind of far off, but you can see it. You're like, oh, there's some growth. But when you actually go there to try and get resources from it or some fruit or you have to eat, you know, you'll realize that they're all weeds and you're like, oh, I have to take these weeds out of my garden. Yeah. And so the more that you do, it gives more opportunities for you to test your environment. Are you around people that are genuinely showing up for you are being accountable? How do you work with people that are going to help you get to where you want to go? And then it'll just make, it'll, it literally is the best uh, filter for an environment is to. So, right. I, I mean, I think, I, I mean, I've been talking about this a lot and I've always sort of believed in love leadership and, you know, uh, you know, choosing to work. And, you know, when you're starting out, you don't always feel like you have the choice and, and that's somehow you know how we all learn you get beaten up a little you work with a you know a psychotic lunatic or two and you know you, you learn some things but yeah 
But I think that, uh, you know, increasingly, you know, like, the, as you're saying, deciding where to put the energy, where do you want to, who do you want to put your energy into? Are the people who are going to be reciprocal and bring something back to you and provide support? You know, like, is, is the work that you're doing going to feel purposeful and meaningful enough that it's going to sustain you? I think that yeah. these are important questions. And what you're talking about, which is, you know, finding agency so that you can create without feeling overwhelmed by a system that is constantly throwing up roadblocks to your creativity, I think it's got to be one of the most uh, liberating feelings ever just to get there and say, you know what, I'm out of that. I'm just going to go play here in this garden and grow my own roses and, you know, see what happens. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm really happy. That's how well, I that's feel. Um, any parting thoughts for our audience? Yeah, I think going off of what you were just saying is like, uh, don't think about how I can get an agent. Think about how you can be an agent of your own change. Um, oh. Don't let like somebody take your agency from you because, you know, they want you to think that you don't have any, but you do. That's ex excellent parting advice. Um, thank you all very much for attending. And thank you, Kyle, so much for giving us your time and, and sharing your thoughts about how to reinvent Hollywood. We're trying to be a little subversive. Um, we also have uh, upcoming uh, Ted Sullivan um, in, this, uh, in June, who is uh, gonna talk about the toxicity of the writer's room. He's uh, currently a showrunner on Riverdale. Um, cool. And uh, he's uh, very frank. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Um, and we also are gonna do an interview with um, Bruno Eloa, who is a real entrepreneur. He's an executive, a comedian, and a clothing designer um, using all of those avenues to explore the Latinx experience in Southern California. Thank um, you, Nina. It's always a pleasure uh, it is such getting a to pleasure see you. To have you, Kyle. I apologize for doing our little plug at the end, but you know, I got to do that. Um, you got to do it. Got to do it. But um, thank you again. So nice to see you. And I look forward to seeing you in person soon now that we're coming around the bend. Likewise. Stay safe, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Bye.